Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament lectionary podcast for preachers, teachers, and you. Everyone needs more Bible in their lives, and this is a fun way to get it. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. This week, we're bringing you exegetical insights from Proverbs 22. Get this, verses 1 through 2, 8 through 9, 22, and 23. <laughs> the first reading assigned for September 5th, 2021. Rachel's up to bat this week, so I'll hand it over to you, Rach. Sounds great. Okay, so this week actually begins a little mini-series that the lectionary gives us on Proverbs. So before we dive into the text itself, I want to say just a few words on what kind of literature Proverbs actually is. Good. I need that. All right. All right. (laughs) Don't we all? So Proverbs comes from a particular kind of literary genre. Um, in, In case this concept of genre isn't familiar, I'll just say a brief word about that. We have different genres of writing today. We have stuff like cover letters for job interviews. We have letters to our grandmas. We have romance novels and Twitter feeds. Writings in those particular genres share a similar set of characteristics. They're the same length in terms of the Twitter feed. They may have a similar purpose, like in terms of a cover letter, which is to get you a job. Um, They entertain in the genre of romance novels. And in the case of Letters to Grandma, they ensure that we get the best of the Christmas cookies amongst all the grandchildren. That's important. So you know the conventions of the genre to get what you need. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So we may not talk about writing in terms of genre today, but we definitely have it. And, and we know it when we see it. We can tell the difference between a cover letter and a Twitter post. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Post? Is it a post? What's it called? It's a tweet. A, a tweet. There we go. <laughs> we know the difference between a cover letter and a tweet. The same thing is true about the Bible. Proverbs comes from a particular kind of genre called wisdom literature. Mm-hmm. Now, Now, first off, I kind of have to start with a caveat because wisdom literature, that term, is at its heart just a scholarly construction. It doesn't mean it's wrong, but it means that there's nothing in the book of Proverbs itself that says, I am wisdom literature, uh, nor in any other text that we call a wisdom text for that matter. But it's also true that as people have read the Bible throughout centuries, Many of them have noticed a group of texts that have some pretty significant family resemblances, if you're borrowing a term from Wittgenstein. So an example for for wisdom literature is, first of all, authority is always rooted in the experience of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. You could think of something like when Jesus says, consider the lilies of the field. Another way to say this is just that you can understand uh, abstract things about God and the universe just from observing your everyday life. So so think of wisdom literature as the Jerry Seinfeld of the Bible. (laughs) So that's one thing. Another thing is because of this emphasis on the ordinary, wisdom texts just don't usually talk about the big, massive salvation events. So in the Old Testament, they won't reference things like the Exodus. Instead, there's just an appeal to what we humans can learn in everyday experience. Mm-hmm. Another thing is, is they have a really robust theology of creation. It, it, wisdom literature believes that God and God's intentions for the world are written directly into the natural world. And what's really lovely about that is this tradition decenters humanity in favor of what is right and just for all of creation, which is really a, a breath of fresh air, I think. The last thing I'll say is that there's a really clear understanding that good is going to triumph and the wicked aren't ultimately going to win and they can't stop what's coming, which is, you know, basically God's justice. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So that's that's helpful. I, I, I needed that sort of review of wisdom literature. So now <laughs> we've got a sense of the of the sort of parameters of what makes for mm-hmm. wisdom literature. So where do we go from there? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so if you take a sum that there's a focus on the lessons of the everyday, there's a strong theology of knowing God through the natural world, and there's a definite sense that the good will triumph. When we have that summary, we find those in places like Job, Ecclesiastes, some of the Psalms, and Proverbs. Aha, Proverbs. So we're getting to the text (laughs) now, right? I'm close. I'm close. Okay, (laughs) 
So now, normally, you and I kind of weep and gnash our teeth when the Revised Common Lectionary does the sort of hopscotch jumping around a pericope like we see today. Am I right? Oh, yeah. My teeth are so gnashed. So gnashed. (laughs) But in the book of Proverbs, it's actually a more appropriate thing to do. Hmm. Proverbs is, is made up of these little maxims, these little units of one to two verses that can kind of stand on their own. Or, or they can. They can be dealt with on their own or in the company of their surrounding friend maxims. So what the Revised Common Lectionary did with this text is to pull out three of these friend maxims, three maxims that address a similar topic, the treatment of the poor, and put them in conversation with each other. So what we're given, what we end up with, is a small treatise on the relationship between the rich and the poor, an observational wisdom that is drawn from observing life and seeing what true theologies can be pulled out of it. (laughs) So are you actually complimenting the the compilers of the Revised Common Lectionary for the way that they handled this text? Uh, Not quite. I I am saying it was an appropriate thing to do in this text, but I think they missed the boat. Oh. Because they missed one maxim that I would have included. And Mm. and it's it's in verse four. So in verses two to three, we have uh, this idea that the rich and poor have everything in common, that God makes us all. In verses eight through nine, we have this idea that whoever sows injustice will reap bad stuff. um, But those who are generous are blessed as they share their bread with the poor. And between those two comes verse four. Verse four says, The reward for humility and fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Now, does that surprise you, Tim, that that's the one I would have wanted included here? It does a little bit. Right, because it's this idea that God pours out material wealth on people just because they're faithful, right? That doesn't work for you? Yeah, right, exactly. (laughs) Well, it doesn't work for me. And I'll tell you what, I don't actually think it works in this text either. I think this text is critiquing that. But I think a lot of folks in our pews have come in contact with that idea. And and that's actually the reason I would lift it up as a good, solid preaching point for this week. Mm. Um, so, so back up a little bit for some history. I don't know if you remember this, Tim, but in 2000, there was a guy named Bruce Wilkerson, and he published a book called The Prayer of Jabez, or Jabez. I don't actually know how to say that. But the subtitle is Breaking Through to the Blessed Life. In this book, he encouraged Christians to daily prayer from 1 Chronicles 4.10, which is this. Jabez cried out to the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. Let your hand be with me and keep me from the evil one. And God granted his request. So in his book that he wrote in 2000, Wilkerson argued that God is always wanting God's people to have material prosperity. That if God were to get the divine way, God would shower wealth and riches down upon the faithful people. I, do you remember that book at all, Tim? Oh, yeah. It was It's a, it was like a super bestseller. It was like number one on the you know right. New York Times book list for ages and ages. Lots of people yeah, exactly. wanted to get the goods. Exactly. Now, there are several problems with this theology that God wants to shower material riches down upon the people. Um, But one of the things that I want to focus on is the kind of riches that it thinks God wants to shower on us. Hmm. The kind of riches, like I said, that this book talks about are undeniably material. It's wealth, it's money, stocks, nice houses, nice cars, all of that kind of stuff. And that's what Proverbs 22, 4 seems to be talking about as well, right? Riches and honor and life. Yes, exactly. But... In the larger context, in the rest of the chapter, I think there's actually a play being made here. Okay, I'm interested to hear this. Okay, so look at Proverbs 22, verse 9 with me. It's five verses after verse 4, just in case you can't do basic math, which I have trouble (laughs) with sometimes. And I think it offers some really helpful context because there's two ways that you can read verse 9. You could read it first as what we call causal which means that the first half of the sentence is caused by the second half. Those who are generous are blessed because they share their bread with the poor. 
This is a little better than the prayer of Jabez, but still the idea seems to be that if you are generous, not just if you pray this little prayer, then God will rain blessings down upon your head like a giant divine slot machine. But there's another way to read it. That little Hebrew word key, which I translated just now as because, Mm -hmm. it doesn't just show a causal relationship or, or not necessarily. It can also have an explaining character to it. So in that case, one could read this verse as, those who are generous are blessed that they share their bread with the poor. This reading gives a whole different understanding of what the reward and riches of verse 4 might be. Because in this reading, blessing doesn't come because the generous share what they have. It comes in the act of sharing itself. Or in other words, sharing one's bread is the blessing. It is both act and reward. So, I mean, I just, I think, you know, think of those you know who are truly, truly happy. Most often, those people are also really generous. And often, they're not happy because they're rewarded for their generosity, They're happy because their generosity provokes this sort of blessed relationships. Their generosity is the act and blessing in and of itself. So I would agree with Bruce Wilkerson that (laughs) the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do want to bless those who love God. But I think that they are wise enough to know the difference between what the world calls a blessing and what is a true blessing in our lives. I think that's where this little wisdom text is leading us. And if I were preaching this week, that's where I'd go with a sermon. Nice. I like that. It's very holistic in a way. The doing of generosity is in itself the blessing. Yeah, exactly. They are blessed in that almost they get to share their bread, you know, that that's the blessing. Well, great. Uh, Thanks for a like, little introduction to how this whole genre of wisdom literature works. And for not stopping there, but pushing us through to think deeply about the little wisdom lits that we get (laughs) in this this electionary passage for us. Well, that's a good place for us to wrap up for this week. If you're feeling wise, then you will know that the wise thing to do is to go to (laughs) firstreadingpodcast.com and subscribe to the podcast. And if you are super wise, you will share it with all of your friends and family because uh, that's that's what God wants you to do. (laughs) Absolutely. Amen. Uh, You can find us uh, wherever you get podcasts. We want to, before we go, say thank you to Trinity Lutheran Seminary at Capital University for the grant that they've given us to help us do this. And thanks to you all for listening and for interacting with us. Uh, That's what makes all of this worthwhile. So thanks to you all. Until next time, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Happy preaching.